meditation for me is um, my sadhana, which means my practice, a personal practice. So it's not uh, something that I share with other people. Um, it doesn't happen in a drop-in class. It happens in my home. Um, and getting uh, into meditation is, for me, uh, a ritual and that involves cleansing, so morning rituals of cleansing, like literally um, the neti pot, uh, scraping my tongue. Um, all of these are part of the Hatha Yoga Pradipika Dauti cleansing practices. Um, and then asana, moving my body and doing some pranayama breath work. So those are all like sort of the physical aspects, um, but the actual um, meditation is doing some deeper deeper work, self-inquiry. And that, uh, at this point in my life and in my work, is necessary, because um, it allows me to show up in right relationship with other people. Um, it allows me to honor the responsibility of being a teacher. Um, and I would also say that it, it's always different. It's, I think the power of non-attachment in your practice is vital because the misconception is that meditation is meant to bring peace, but it's actually meant to bring higher awakening. And in order for us to be awake, we have to see sometimes the mirror of the things that we don't want to see. And um, the universe is such an incredible teacher, so uh, making space for meditation um, and then actually doing that work. It's been really powerful, yeah. It's changed my life. And it has to be every day now. There's times in my life where it wasn't every day, and it definitely shows up. It's like either an old habit or a pattern of mine or uh, arises, or um, I become reactionary in a way that doesn't speak truly to being grounded and centered and steady. Chotaka Mudra is a meditation of staring at a still lake. And I've been doing that since I was young. Um, and letting the water's calmness um, be reflected back in my mind. And then my thoughts um, formulate from that spaciousness. Uh, walking meditations have been a powerful part of my life. But yeah, the actual seated meditation, probably. I think it's been over 10 years, but I guess I haven't really been counting. I, I know that's something some people do. They're like, I've been 24 years on my cushion. I'm, like, okay. <laughs> I'm not really counting. <laughs> Sometimes it's in the afternoon or evening, and that's deliberate. There are times where I really need to have it in the morning, but it's deliberate because the practice needs to happen every day um, so I can show up for myself and for other people. But if I were to put a lot of pressure on myself to be like, okay, every morning at 5 a.m. this is going to happen, that's not realistic with the kind of work that I'm doing because sometimes I'm asked to do like a breathing session and grounding session at a show. I've done that before. Um, and that's like a late night. Mm -hmm. and so giving myself some spaciousness from time and that linearity. And that is also um, in relationship to this idea of productivity. So I think about how our healing practice has been kind of in narratives um, mired by productivity. If I do this, then I'm able to do this. But it really should be about being. And we have to keep going back to that again and again and again. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing would be, um, I mentioned this, but the Tao cleansing practices. So to cleanse and to purify the nadis in the yogic tradition is how we come to our seat, to our asana, our physical meditation. And so literal cleansing um, of my
my nadis of like the neti pot and um, tongue scraping and um, like what else do I do? Like <laughs> a number of different rituals need to happen in the morning mm -hmm. um, that create a boundary practice for me to go out into the world. And um, yeah, a powerful one would be Fred Doughty, which I think you've done with me before, um, but cleansing and clearing the heart. Um, when I first learned that practice, I was doing a lot of protest and activism, and I was getting really burnt out. And so um, that actual literal practice became this projection for me um, to take care of myself. And, um, and then I just started accumulating through study, through practice more. So nidra is um, vital to me now. And in some ways, I mean, I could be dramatic and say it saved my life. Um, in some ways it did. I think um, had I d continued down a path of the work I was doing without waking up to these practices through um, my teachers and these teachings, um, I'd get really run down. And, and that just turns into dis-ease and imbalance. And people really forsake the power of rest it doesn't sound very cool. It sounds like a waste of time. No one has time to rest. Um, but your body will let you know then, if that's the case, that you are making that argument. Your mind will let you know, your nervous system, your tissues, your muscles, your bones, everything, your spirit, your heart center will let you know that this is not where you need to be. And, um, so I need rest, and um, and then I need to also kindle my fire. So a physical asana practice, a lot of different types of breath practices, pranayama practices to kindle fire are important. Um, who I spend time with kindles my fire. I think also just grounding in truth is a practice that everyone needs to remember the truth of who you are, um, who you've always been, that um, identity politics are really important, but they, um, they can really be exhausting. Mm -hmm. And then there's that practice of rest, because your mind is not swirling around, who am I, who do I need to be, what do I need to do? It's actually just nothing, having mm -hmm. takes practice because for most people even just lying down it's like I get to do this <laughs> and then when I do it like my mind is really active and that's okay yeah so. it forced me to see things I didn't want to see um, when I came into relationship with what I wanted to do in my life, uh, it's like, okay, great, you know what you want to do, but what are you going to do to make that happen? And what's standing in the way, and what was standing in the way was me. And so uh, getting into a practice of recognizing my responsibility to myself um, has deeply impacted my work. The level of um, what's known as tapas friction, literally meaning to heat, um, thinking of life and the friction of life. Um, I went through a lot of that when it became clear what I wanted to do. And I went through a lot of that fire because my life was not in alignment with what I wanted. And, um, and then I also was accumulating a lot of healing work and responsibility to others, and particularly leaders. And you can become pretty sick in that scenario because you're aware of that imbalance, but you're not doing anything about it. And so the meditation was the, the doing, the, the action, um, but also uh, 
the reminder of like, okay, if you want this to happen, take what's happening on the seat on the cushion and actually implement it in your life. And so it gave me courageousness. Um, it gave me, you know, my teachers gave me the skill set, the what's known as um, adhikara, the preparation to climb that mountain. Um, but it gave me this deep inner resource of knowing. So um, sometimes people talk about imposter syndrome when they come into work or art, um, especially with what they really desire, right? It's like, I really want this, but I don't believe I can do it. And my meditation practice, um, I, have, I don't experience that when I teach, and it's clearly my practice. So, and teaching is um, the most like powerful thing in my life, and it comes out and through me in many a multitude of ways, um, and I wouldn't be able to do that without my meditation. Yeah. Healing justice is um, a social justice movement that. Um, really seeks to disrupt and dismantle the sort of normative ways that we think healing can happen um, and where and how. So I think about like access to healing and equity and our in right relationship with healing justice, like who gets to heal where, when, and how is um, something that we really need to examine in this country and in, in this city. Healing justice is also, um, it's, uh, you know, rooted in Black Lives Matter. Um, BLM has worked with it a lot, also a lot of indigenous and native folks. Um, and I feel like a lot of black, brown, indigenous POC folks, um, queer trans folks, have practiced healing justice without the language um, for a long time. And so I, I use it as a framework, it's quite a big framework, but I think about um, making space for people to heal as a human right. And um, it's one that has, uh, is, is not available to all of us right now. So for me, it's like if I'm a healer and an educator and I am a woman of color and I'm queer, and I have these intersecting modalities, um, and I'm not seeing in this work people who look like me, that's a problem. And not seeing ways in which there's access, um, and also the question of like deserving it. Do I deserve to go on a retreat in another country and take time for myself, for self-mastery, for rest? Um, because the doubt that might emerge comes from um, years and years of systemic um, violence, institutional oppression, healing justices, like actually all practices must center in our healing. Yeah, and so what does that look like? And sometimes I'll give examples just um, when I'm speaking broadly to a number of people, regardless of their race, gender, sexuality, is that like, what does it look like in the workplace for your boss to go around the room and be like, let's do a nervous system check on, check up, right? Like, mm -hmm. let's actually acknowledge that there's a nervous system in this room. Um, I feel like it's like micro stuff and then really macro stuff, legislation. Um, could be healing justice for some people, um, changing laws to create better access. Um, the People's Movement Center is a healing justice space in Minneapolis and kind of like a cornerstone for particularly QT BIPOC folks. Um, Family Tree Clinic is also a space, a, a physical space of healing justice. They do a lot of work for um, folks who are HIV positive for living with AIDS and then also um, the trans uh, folks who are, um, you know, working with different types of like therapies or um, transition. The book Care Work, uh, Disability Justice by Leel Akshmi, she talks about, um, she has these questions about what does your healing practice look like? And one of them is really like, is your healing practice about a practice of um, ableism? Like 
how much your body can actually perform and do and produce. Um, and yeah, that for me is like a really big thing right now. Um, because not everybody can do everything. And all of us at some point won't be able to do everything. Galen Lee, who's also a um, singer, activist, and disability justice um, and musician, um, talks about that too. Like, eventually all of our bodies will become disabled in certain ways. And so when I talk to students, I'm like, you know, if you don't have an arm or you lose your leg, does that mean you can't practice yoga? Um, and it's like, oh, okay, then maybe there's other modalities of yoga that I can touch into that embody the practice of rest, the practice of space, the practice of slowing down, the practice of stopping to feel. I'll start with self-care um, because it becomes this deep singular event that uh, and has become the singular event through capital capitalism. So um, now you have to have a lot of money to take care of yourself. Um, mobility, being able to go somewhere. Um, and not everyone has that. So then what does self-care mean? That only folks who have power and privilege are able to take care of themselves? Um, and then what about everybody else? If we're coming to our mat and doing our practice and disregarding everyone in the room and everyone in the city and the ways in which specific populations and communities are deeply impacted by state violence or um, inequity, um, what does self-care mean? You know, If we're consistently talking about the dialogue of self-care being empowerment and change and being a better person, then um, a lot of things should not be happening right now because the uh, self-care paradigm, that language has been around for a while. Um, and it just doesn't, I think it's not that I disapprove or dislike because I know also that, um, you know, it's like the quote that I talk about, my subversive sirens, my swim team, my synchro team use from Audre Lorde, which is um, self-care is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. That's the entire quote. And I really do think about it is self-preservation. So I like to use that language that Lloyd gave us. Um, and then wellness is like <laughs> loaded. And these two words are highlighted so often in media and you only get to see one type of person. Mm -hmm. If you type in self-care on Google, I guarantee it's gonna be mostly white people in the images. Wellness, the same thing. And then it just gets to be stretched out so much, like the word namaste, that it loses its meaning. Namaste is a way to acknowledge someone's humanity in my perspective a way to ground into gratitude, a way to see somebody. But now you have like shirts that say like, namaste bitches and things, and like, it's kind of a joke. <laughs> in Kerala we say namaskara, so I like to greet students sometimes when I'm writing people instead of saying namaste, I'll say that, but they're kind of similar. You know, there's a way in which capitalism has um, been like, ooh, self-care is trendy. Like, how can we turn self-care as a practice of self-preservation into self-care as a practice of, you need to buy this, 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 and it just continues, it never ends, um, in order to heal. So you're constantly just expending and buying. Her birthday, and she passed away 
I feel like I've said five years for the last couple of years, um, but I'm just gonna say five years because I don't know how many years it's been. Um, she and my mom co basically like co-parented me and um, she just taught me so much about my joy and my right to happiness um, so often and it's left such a imprint in my life when she was alive and then when she passed away. And because, you know, she passed away suddenly, so it was pretty devastating. I lost a parent. And um, I lost her at a time, I was in school, I was studying in college, and um, no one I knew had lost a parent, so it was super isolating. And, um, and then my, one of my mentors in college lost a parent, like a couple months later. And then I remember, like, the honors department, uh, my counselor forgetting that I lost my parent. Um, and so there was a way in which nobody recognized my grief um, because we don't recognize it in this country. And um, I, I went through quite a lot. Um, and I remember like a couple years after she passed away, it still being really hard, especially around um, the anniversary of her death in March and then her birthday and she and I are both Gemini's so we had this like just really deep relationship um, and I remember asking my mom like when is this gonna get easier and my mom said something like you know her mom died when she was young in high school and it was devastating for her she said there's like this little space in your heart that never really goes away and it's them um, it's the space of them not being there, and it's them just always being present with you. And I remember crying on the phone with her and face-to-face and -face being like, I just, I want this to get easier. And it has through my practice, because um, yoga and Ayurveda are really also about acknowledging death. Um, and being able to grieve the world as it is, and hold those emotions. Um, and so she became my greatest teacher because now I understand life in a completely different way. And it's, that is a journey as well, that I, um, on days when I really miss her, um, I'm continuing to learn from her death. And I think in the last year, I've started to say to myself um, a couple of times that her death is, has really been my greatest gift or her greatest gift, rather, to me. Um, and that's a pretty revolutionary mindset from where I was. So even though she's not here on this earth, she's still like impacting me. And I totally miss her. There are times when, um, uh, since she's passed, I've met some really powerful people in my life. And sometimes it's kind of crazy to think that they, they never get to meet her. Um, but, you know, people are always with you, so in some ways they do get to meet her, just it happens to be through me. <laughs> so yeah, I would say definitely her. So I'm building a fundraiser for um, predominantly QT BIPOC uh, folks to study with me for free. And that funding is from a desire not only to see the study for free, but a stipend. So if someone wants to go on a retreat out of the country with me, they can figure out how to do that without like, leaving their job and feeling a lot of anxiety around that. Um, and so that's a big thing I'm working on. But um, I have my donation vinyasa practice Monday morning at Tarana. And they're, they're very powerful practices that I'm teaching. Um, and I love that it's donation-based. Um, and so I'm doing that, working on the fundraiser. I'm headed to New York for the Stonewall Rebellion with my synchronized swim team, uh, the Subversive Sirens. That's a really big deal. We're um, highlighting the work of trans activist Silvia Rivera, who was a front, frontliner on really all of 
um, what is now known as Pride, um, the Stonewall Rebellion, which happened in 1969. Sylvia was there. And um, recognizing trans folks of color who started Pride is important because right now this country is creating a lot of legislation to not recognize even their humanity. And um, yeah, so that's a big thing. And then in July, I'm uh, going down to Texas to work with predominantly BIPOC educators um, who've probably worked with everything from like ICE to gender, race, sexuality issues in the classroom um, that are showing up as a result of systemic racism and institutional violence. And um, I, the people who called me down to do this work um, found me through the National Education Association and said that they had heard my work was so powerful there, they wanted to collaborate. Um, and I'm really excited to do that. Um, yeah. And then I always, I always tell people just, you can just type in Sarita and Yoga and my website pops up and you can find out all the details.